Welcome to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast for club owners, operators, and fitness professionals. Each week, host Brian O'Rourke brings you an expert interview with a global influencer at the crossroads of fitness and technology. You gain the insights, tools, and inspiration you need to stay connected to the pulse for what matters most for your business in the age of exponential technologies. Hey, welcome to the podcast. I'm your host, Brian O'Rourke. And before we get started with our interview with Angela, um, I wanted to uh, say hello, Fall. Um, you may have seen the announcement recently about my taking on a post as CEO of Core Health and Fitness, which is a global brand of uh, equipment, including Stairmaster, Star Trek, Schwinn, Throwdown, Wexer, uh, Star Trek. Um, I hope I didn't miss one. Um, so thanks for all of your congrats on that. I still will be doing this podcast, and I'll be still involved with the Fitness and Technology Council. So thank you again for your kind um, uh, congrats and support. Um, so, um, you know, I look forward to seeing, uh, listeners, uh, around the world at different events, uh, at the end of this year and into next. So, um, so it's an exciting time. Um, now about our guest, Angela, uh, Mascaratolo is a senior financial, uh, senior analyst, I'm sorry, for fitness and smart home. And she is at PC magazine and she's been doing this for over 10 years and she's written 6,000 articles and reviews on technology, um, she was um, a reporter for eight years covering consumer tech before becoming an analyst uh, at PC Mag, and uh, she has an incredible background um, and is very much attuned to uh, technologies for fitness purposes. Um, she's pretty active on social, so we'll have her links uh, in the in the notes. And we're going to talk a little bit about the most recent Apple release and other types of wearable Fitbits, etc releases and what they mean and what's going on in that space. And she's very knowledgeable about that. So without further ado, let's have Angela on. Welcome listeners. As, as I said in the intro, Angela is joining us today and I can't wait to have this conversation. Angela, where do, where do we find you this morning? Hi, thanks for having me. I am in, well, it's near Tampa, Florida. We'll say that um, little beach town near Indian Rocks Beach. A lovely area. You're lucky to live by the beach. I think so. I mean, I think there was a quote, if you're lucky enough to live by the beach, you're lucky enough. And uh, I feel that way for sure. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, as I said in the uh, intro, um, you know, it really, I really am looking forward to this on many levels. First, your, you know, your expertise in the uh, fitness technology component of the world. And the fact, Angela, that you are a yoga instructor. So, uh, you know, you're not only covering tech, you're actually a fitness professional as well, which is a cool combination. How did you get into yoga? Um, I got into yoga when I was living in New York City at a gym, actually. I just started going to classes at my local gym and took me a little while, a couple of months to actually get the courage to go to a yoga studio, an actual yoga studio. But um when I did, then I just, I really fell in love with it. And um, I've been at it ever since. I've been teaching now for about 10 years. Um, and I've taught several different styles of yoga, but the most recent that I switched into last year, um, which was really, um, uh, I, I would guess, inspired by uh, my coverage of fitness technology is this new style called Sculpt Yoga which incorporates um, dumbbells and light, light hand weights in with the yoga flow. So it's more of a fitness uh, oriented type of yoga. And we do like high energy music and it's really fun. But we start out very chill with uh, normal yoga. And then we start incorporating the uh, weights. And I just have such a passion for it. I think it's very effective uh type of fitness and it's fun i love the group setting and i love the community of it because you know i work from home i'm a writer yep. and an editor and you know that can get a little bit like you need to get out right yeah. so that yoga gives me that community too that i love 
Yeah, and you uh, now you're involved with a couple of studios, aren't you, in your area? Yeah, yeah. The studio that I teach at is Just 26 Yoga, um, yeah. and it's a local studio here. We now have two of them, uh, but I've taught all over around the area um, and even taught on the beach. Uh, but for me, that was like I taught there for like two years and it's amazing. It's like a dream when I first moved to Florida. But it's very unpredictable. Like you never know that what's going to happen when you're on the beach. There'll be like bird one day getting caught in a net, which was like crazy and scary and and sad. And then another day there'll be people off to the side that don't want to pay for the class, but want to do the class. And (laughs) and they'll be doing the class on their own. (laughs) Or, yeah. you know, they'll, you'll be smelling like the wafting of, um, you know, people doing their whatever they want to do, they're smoking and all of that. And you're like, okay, there's, it's very unpredictable when you're, when you're doing yoga on the beach. So, <laughs> now I'm in a studio. <laughs> <laughs> Wise. Huh? That's good. Less, yeah. less confusion there. So for the listeners, you'll see in the show notes, we connected in your social accounts. I was enjoying catching up on your TikTok this morning and your 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 reels and different things you posted. And not that long ago, you were at the Wonderlust event in at Apple's headquarters, right? With the release of the Series Nine and the Ultra Two and the new iPhone. Uh, here's my titanium one right here. Yes. Uh, share some of your observations on the uh, Series Nine. What what were your impressions of that technology? Yeah, so I have the Series 9 right here. Yep, um, me too. <laughs> yeah, oh, you have it too. <laughs> and I have the Ultra 2 as well. So, um, you know, it's always exciting to actually go to the event in person and um, be able to experience all of the all the hoopla that Apple puts on. And, you know, they really do put on quite a show, I'll say. Um, they really think about the experience around the product, um, whether it's from, you know, the, the unboxing experience to, you know, all these little touches that they put into, uh, the product, which I love, but, um, as far as the series nine and the ultra two, uh, the big updates that we have this year are, um, the processor going to the S nine SIP. Now, last generation, uh, the Series 8 and the Ultra had the uh, S8 uh, SIP, which is the processor. So I told, uh, you know, when I was talking to um, my contact at Apple, I said, I've never written so much about a processor before. (laughs) But what um, the processor really, um, the, the efficiency of the processor has allowed them to increase the brightness of the display on both devices. Um, The Series 9 is going up to 2000 nits brightness. Um, And that, and then the Ultra 2 is going up to 3000 nits brightness, which is, it happens to be the brightest display that Apple has ever put to market. Um, and and the difference here really shows up when you're outside yeah. in the bright sunlight. So if you're trying to follow the compass or if you're trying to read um, text on the display, um, it's it's easier when you're in that bright sunlight with the brighter display. You don't have to move your wrist around to you know get rid of the glare to find a good angle. You know, it, it's that bright that it's easy to see all the time. You don't have to squint your eyes to look, to read a text message. And a lot of the times these little complications on the watch face are very tiny. Yeah. Of course, they're bigger on the Ultra 2 display because the Ultra 2 is just massive. Yeah. But um, yeah, so that's the big thing where um, they have uh, put in a new processor, which really happens every year. But that has allowed um, the efficiency has allowed this increase in spree- screen brightness. And this is the big point without a decrease in battery life, because um, what was very disappointing, its main competitor, Samsung uh, in the smartwatch market, the Galaxy Watch 6 series did the same thing this year. They went from 1000 nits to 2000 nits. Same thing as the um, Apple Watch Series 9, 
but at the expense of battery life. We were seeing last year's the series um, or the Galaxy Watch 5 model, even the regular model, not the Pro, because the Pro has the bigger battery. Um, the regular model was getting like 30 something hours of battery life. And that's been slashed down to less than 24. And what I will say, it's getting a little nitty gritty here, right? But um, with Apple, they only have three brightness settings, like low, medium, and high. And with the Samsung watches, they give you a lot more granular control over the brightness where there's a slider. You can turn off the adaptive brightness or keep it on with Apple, it's on all the time. So what that means is the watch is using the ambient light sensor to detect how much light is in your environment and will um, adjust the screen brightness accordingly to optimize battery life and view, you know, viewability. Because if you're in a very, uh, if you're in your house, it's not going to put the display at that max either 2000 or 3000 nits, it will be like half that. Um, and, but then when you go outside, it automatically switches to the higher nits. Now there's no way to force it to stay at that higher nits the whole time. Like you can on the galaxy watch, but what I'll say with the galaxy watch is it could be hard to find those settings that give you more battery life. Like the only way I got more than 24 hours with it is when I turned off the always on display. And for me, an always on display on a smartwatch is like a key feature. I need that always on display. I don't want the screen to turn off ever. Um, so with the always on display enabled, the Apple watch gets better battery life than the Galaxy watches. Um, so those are the big updates now the series um nine sip the s9 sip also enables some new features um one of them is called double tap where you tap your pointer finger and thumb together twice and this can do all different things like um answer a phone call so say you have your arms full of groceries and you get an important call and you need to take it on your watch you can use the double tap gesture it's not going to be rolling out until October, um, which is only uh, tomorrow as we uh, film this. But um, I have tested it. Um, Apple sent a unit that had this feature running in beta. And I also tested it at the Wonderlust event on their demo units there. It works really well. Um, I'll say that you have to like put the raise your wrist up to your face and then do the gesture. But you can do the gesture if you use the wrong finger, like if you use your middle finger instead or, or your ring finger, it usually still works. If you use your pinky, it really doesn't work, but it's not going to. Um, also, I tested it uh, where to see if I could like trigger a false positive by like snapping my fingers and that didn't work. So like if you're at a concert, you shouldn't like trigger it by like snapping your fingers. Um so there's double tap, then there's new, um, like a precision finding feature where, I mean, one of the most um, commonly used features on the Apple Watch is find my phone. <laughs> I use it all the time. Me right? too, me too. Yeah, yeah. And it's like in the other room. But now yeah. if you have, and this only works because it has to have the series, the S9 SIP. Um, it only works with either the Series 9 or the Ultra 2 when you have a iPhone 15, the new iPhone family, right. okay? But if you have that stuff, then um, when you press Find My Phone on the watch, it will now show you the actual distance you are in feet. Mm -hmm. um, from, from that, when you're in within a certain range, I don't know the range offhand, but this is good, right? Like if you happen to lose your phone, like at a party or at a loud environment, like normally I, I could just hear the right. auto ding and find it, but right. you no, know, it would be a nice peace of mind if it, if the environment is loud that you'll be able to see, okay, well, it is around here. And then, right. and then it actually guides you. It does like a direction cone mm -hmm. where it will di direct you there when you're within a certain um, range. 
So, um, yeah, like the updates overall, I will say are minor. Like if you already have a uh, Series 8 watch from last year or an Ultra watch, then I would not upgrade. Um, the good thing is they're not getting a price increase. So like anybody who is in the market for a new Apple watch, these are they're still great options. They're just getting better. I just wouldn't say that they're the updates are big enough to warrant um, yeah. an update from last year's model. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but yeah, they're just as good as ever. Um, and they're just um, brighter now, but the ultra two, um, you know, I wasn't, I'll be completely honest with you. Um, the biggest fan of the ultra just because it's too big for yeah. my wrist. Yeah. <laughs> and out of all of them, like I get all every one, and the funny enough, the one that I wear day to day usually is the cheapest yeah. and the smallest, the SE, the watch yeah. SE. That one does not have the always on display. But what I like about it is that it's the smallest one mm -hmm. and it's the most affordable. So don't discount that SE. It didn't get an upgrade this year, um, yeah. but it, usually it doesn't get an upgrade every year. It's usually like every other year. Uh, so I was surprised that the ultra got an update this year, but like I said, the yeah. update is pretty minor. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, with respect to that, and, and by the way, I loved your post from the Wonderless event, you know, looking through your feed and seeing that you're right. They great at putting on uh theater. Uh, you know, it's really quite, quite an experience. What other, I know that there's some news around Fitbit. There's some other wearable technologies that are launching uh, tell us your impression of those and what your what your view is on that. Yeah, so the one I'm really excited about is the Fitbit Charge 6. Now, as we're taping this, this was just announced yesterday. Um, now, this is like sub 150, I think like 149-ish um, fitness tracker. The Charge line is Fitbit's flagship product their most popular product, their, their, you know, main fitness tracker, their most advanced fitness tracker. This has a built-in GPS. Um, this has a built-in, um, it does SPO2 tracking, which is blood oxygen saturation. It does temperature, um, tracking. Um, I, and I believe it's only overnight. Um, but, so what they're saying for this new generation is, first of all, it looks exactly the same as last, <laughs> the Charge 5. But um, if you have a Charge 5, that wasn't updated since um, 2021. So it's been two years now um, that they waited. Um, so that device is probably getting pretty old at this point. And it may have already broke. I know some people that had a charge five and it already broke. And, okay. you know, sometimes people get very, you know, Fitbit people are loyalists. They really are like Apple people, like Garmin people, yep. um, you know, they're, they're really loyal to their brand and they get really disappointed when um, something breaks or it doesn't work. But anyway, there's a new model coming. And the big thing about it is, um, the accuracy, or Fitbit says, the accuracy of the heart rate measurements. So they've done some work on the sensor, um, and they say that certain types of um, activities, such as um, rowing and I think running, um, heart rate measurements will be like 60% more accurate which is amazing. But what we see in um, wrist-based um, heart rate tracking technology, it's called optical, um, optical technology, basically, instead of like an ECG, like what a chest strap would use, which right. is electrical. Okay, yeah. with this optical wrist-based stuff, it can tend to lag slightly mm -hmm. when it comes to detecting a rapid heart rate change during workout. So if your if your heart rate goes from resting to 160 within you know you you do like a quick sprint um and and it, you know it might not grab some of these optical monitors might not grab that elevated heart rate for up to 30 seconds 
uh, we have seen the lag um, compared to a chest strap. Yep. Now, what I love about the Apple Watch is this is just as accurate as a chest strap in my testing. Yep. Um, you get that elevated heart rate right away. <laughs> yeah. So if yeah. you want, I mean, the general, um, you know, recommendation has always been, if you want the most accurate heart rate, yeah. get a chest strap, right? right? But um, Apple has come in with, in my testing, you know, very close, um, right on the money as far as, uh, you know, their measurements versus a chest strap. Um, and a lot of the other um, optical wearable technologies, um, the wrist-based ones, they can lag. So hopefully, well, we haven't gotten it in for testing yet, but um, I'm definitely going to be testing that since that is a new stated feature. Yeah. Um testing the accuracy of its heart rate measurements to actually see, and that will impact other metrics as well. So they use your heart rate to calculate your calories burned. And another um, popular uh, metric that they call active zone minutes, which mm -hmm. is basically a weekly um, activity goal. You want to hit 150 um, active zone minutes for the week. But that's based on your heart rate, because if you're in a higher heart rate zone, they give you like two points for every minute you're in that zone. Um, so this will affect other met the accuracy of other metrics as well. So we love more accurate things. But the my concern about it is that so Fitbit is now part of Google. Yeah. And we're starting to see a lot more Google on the Fitbit devices. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. now with the Fitbit, the Charge 6 music controls, they have introduced, it works for YouTube music and it requires a premium subscription. They're going to give you a one month free premium for YouTube music, but this will allow you to like pause, play, skip, um the music playing on your phone from the tracker but i want to know is it going to work with other services if i have spotify playing on my phone am i going to be able to use that charge to control that i don't think so i right. uh, we still have not received the unit so we have not been able to test that but I, it doesn't seem like that um now the other um thing that was a bit um disconcerting was that with um Fitbit's last generation of smart watches well they call them smart watches the sense um two and the versa four from the generation before to the latest generation they have removed um like an app store so there's okay. no downloadable apps well, this is because Google has the Pixel Watch. So it sort of seems like um, yeah. Google and Fitbit wearables are a bit at odds here. Yeah. Like, why yeah. do the Fitbit wearables, the, the Fitbit smartwatches not get the Play Store right. or not support downloadable apps? It's sort of like you are... Um, you know, limiting their functionality uh, by taking that away. Um, so, I mean, they still do key things like they still do mobile payments um, via um, Google Pay. Now it used to be Fitbit Pay, but it's just something to watch, you know, and now they require um, a Google account to sign in to the Fitbit app. So this is going to be a big consideration for Fitbit people, you know, people who have been legacy users, you know, two generations ago, it did have a Spotify app and now it's just YouTube music. So um, we'll see. The jury is still out, I'll say, on Fitbit's new tracker. Um, I'm excited about the heart rate thing. I'm a bit dubious about the Google stuff. Like they also are putting a Google Maps app on it um, that's been optimized for the display on um, the Charge 6. And that's cool. That's all right. Uh, but is it necessary? I don't know. Um, so, yes. That's interesting. That's interesting. It will be interesting to see what ends up happening there. As these companies try to figure out how to monetize as well the users, I guess that's part of their 
their thinking and how they optimize it. On to another subject, you saw the recent announcement we were talking about before we got on this uh, podcast and start the record button about Peloton and Lululemon and what what's going on with the mirror. Of course, that been a very disappointing outcome for uh, for Lulu, um, and we were discussing the home fitness trends that the COVID pandemic really spiked, and now we've seen a lot of these you know, direct to consumer home fitness solutions with equipment kind of flounder. What what are some of your thoughts on on what that kind of partnership means and what do you see happening there? Yeah. So with the mirror, um, and this was a super hot product a couple of years ago. And like you said, all of this home fitness stuff, the tonal, you know, Peloton, it all blew up during the pandemic and it was booming. Yeah. Um, and then it's sort of, you know, the interest um, died down a lot. And ever since um, Peloton is sort of trying to find their footing in this new, this, this, this different world, this new world now, right? Um, and uh, with the mirror, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Lululemon as a yoga teacher and, sure. you know, just from their apparel, you know, but um, it was so it was exciting to me when they brought bought the mirror, but that was a couple of years ago and the technology started to fall behind, um, you know, with that mirror, it didn't have a touch screen or so, you know, you had to control it from your phone, whereas other competitors like for me. Yeah. which is an amazing one. I really love theirs. Um, I'll shout it out. It, they have a touch screen and the Nordic track vault is another one. And then the echelon reflect touch now. So uh, mirror was really the first one that like made this a thing, but then several other competitors came on and, you know, they have a bigger screen where, you know, it's sort of a hidden screen behind there, but it makes it seem like the trainer is bigger um, so I've been wondering, okay, well, when is Lululemon going to put out a new model? Like they need right. to do something to, you know, have their technology keep up. Um, and you know, they just never did. And right. you know, when I heard the announcement yesterday, um, it, it really, it sort of made sense because, well, it was either come out with a new model in a market where there's less demand or just sort of offload this thing. And um, it's interesting for Peloton because Peloton doesn't have a mirror, right? So, and Peloton now is, you know, they do have other, they have a rolling machine, which we've reviewed. They've had, they have a new strength training camera, but they don't have a mirror. Um, and so it sort of makes sense for them to, instead of bring a new piece of hardware to market in this world, to reach a new audience by putting their content on um, the mirror. So now as part of this deal, I guess all Peloton instructors are going to be wearing Lululemon, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> but then, and they're going to have like co-branded stuff that people can buy. But now they're going to be putting Peloton classes on the mirror. Now, um, my question is how long is support going to continue? Because they did not specify that in the press release. Um, uh, it, Lululemon has said that they will be continuing to produce their own mirror content mm -hmm. through the spring of next year, um, 2024, but they have not said when um, that new content from Peloton or really announced the specifics of is Peloton's entire workout library going to be available on there? or just the strength classes and, or just the yoga, the hit, what is actually going to be going on to like a small selection of the, of Peloton. Cause Peloton has a huge class library, many, many thousands of classes right. as well as mirror too. But um, so I'm just interested in the specifics, obviously for people who own a mirror, this is a bad news it, yeah. because um obviously it means that you know the company is winding down the product yeah. it's no longer going to be sold um and they've only promised support with 
through Lululemon until the spring of next year. So, and there's no guarantee of how long, um, I mean, they said five year, I think partnership. So who knows if they're going to continue putting new Peloton classes on there for five years. I don't know. Um, but yeah, the other interesting thing Peloton is doing is, um, they introduce all these new app tiers to try to get new users to like people that are gym goers, which this is a good idea because, you know, when people go to the gym, oftentimes, you know, I used to be too intimidated to use the free weights. Now I could use the weight machines, but you know, I didn't really know the moves for the free weights. Well, Peloton's new gym classes, they give you a breakdown of uh, what you can do. They do a whole class. Um, and then there's like uh, video demos for each move. And they tell you how many to do. And you can play your own music in the background. You can just have your phone there to guide you through what to do for your workout. So it's really cool. Um, uh, and I, yeah, I'd like I tested the new gym um, feature of the app and I liked it. Mm -hmm. um it's obviously a little more boring than the peloton classes because they're these are self-guided plans um where the peloton classes you have that um energetic instructor telling stories making jokes and you know the music is all played for you but um you know people don't necessarily all want that if they're just doing yeah. their own thing at the gym and this you can stop talk to somebody and and go back to it so but um a lot of people who use the um, Peloton app with a non-Peloton bike. Yeah. So they just um, signed up for, it used to be like $12.99, um, the all access plan, or the, I'm sorry, the app membership, where they would use like a Schwinn bike with the Peloton app. Now it's becoming more expensive to do that because as part of this new app tier, they have created um, a limitation where, you know, the twelve ninety nine plan. Now you can only take like two or three, a, a very limited number of classes per month on the hardware. If you want to have those hardware classes, the bike classes, the rowing classes, the treadmill classes, then you need to go to the higher app tier. You have to pay more. So this is Peloton trying to, you know, eke out a little bit more money mm -hmm. of where they can on those those customers, because I know a lot of people who are do just that. They're love. They love the Peloton classes, but they do not have a Peloton bike. And um, so there is a, a fair amount of people that will be impacted when that change takes effect, which I think is happening um, pretty soon. So um, they'll have to decide, do I want to stick with Peloton and and pay more <laughs> to continue using these hardware classes? Or do I, I want to go to a new service? Mm -hmm. And there are many of competitors out there, including right. Apple's Fitness Plus. Fitness right. Plus has um, cycling classes. Right. They have rowing classes. And they have treadmill classes. So uh, that's going to be something that people are going to have to look into and decide when they see their bill, right? Well, they'll be like, it's not $12.99 anymore. It's <laughs> it's more money to keep using these. Or yeah, when they get locked out of those classes, right? Yeah. yeah. So. And Apple has the benefit with bundling with their services now. So if you're doing music and this and that, they can you can bundle on fitness plus at an even cheaper rate if people bundle. So they have that advantage. Yeah. Yeah. Especially so it'll if be, you have an Apple Watch. So yeah, it'll be interesting, more. interesting to see what happens there for sure. Yeah. Well, well, Angela, thank you for sharing your insights on these very uh timely and relevant changes going on with these new products <laughs> and and services. It's certainly in your expertise in this arena for the last decade, it's certainly been a lot that has happened in the realm of consumer fitness with technology. So given, given that and your thousands of articles that you've written over the years in your role on this subject, and given the fact that you are a yoga instructor who's quite adept at doing that, our listeners have a lot of different professionals in the space. Um, what are some thoughts or advice that you might share for people uh, who are going to be looking uh, you up after this podcast and following your content and what you've been able to do and carving your niche in this space, any observations or kind of 
pearls of wisdom that you'd have for them? I would just say, um, you know, it's, 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 it's not about you <laughs> when you're a fitness professional or whatever, you know, I mean, it really, it's about your client. It's about, you know, their, their needs thinking about that. So as a yoga teacher, you know, when I was early into it, um, you know, I would, I would really think that I had to do the best job and, and it was about, you know, how eloquently I spoke and, but really it's about watching them and trying and, and not worrying about yourself and trying to help, um, others. And, and I think the more that you can do that, the better. And then also like at my job as, um, you know, product reviewer, and with PC Mag, our mission is to help people make buying decisions. And some people are like, they read the reviews and they're like, oh, well, you know, this was sponsored. And it's like, no, 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 absolutely not. If something sounds enthusiastic, it's because I genuinely am about that. And yeah. But, um, you know, I think that it's it's really about, you know, thinking about your audience and what you can how you can help them, how you can make them um, make their life easier or make them feel better or whatever it may be. I think just thinking about others <laughs> would be probably my biggest advice. That's a brilliant advice. I think that uh, that's very uh very cogent and relevant today uh, in many, many uh, respects. So I know our listeners very much appreciate that. Angela, it was wonderful to chat with you today and get your insights. What a privilege it's been to have you on the show. Um, I know people are really going to enjoy it. And please, folks, check out Angela. I will be sharing in the show notes all of her social profiles. She's got some great content on there. And of course, her articles and reviews are fantastic. So I know you all will be looking at those links and checking her out more. Angela, I really enjoyed our chat today. Thank you so much for having me and, and letting me uh, talk your ear off about all of this stuff. <laughs> well, there's a lot to talk about, no doubt. Yes, yes. Well, thanks so much okay. again, Angela. We'll see you again soon. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. Hello, listeners. This is Brian O'Rourke, and thanks so much for listening to the Fitness Plus Technology Podcast. The podcast is made possible by the Fitness Industry Technology Council, a consortium of global brands working together to enhance the adoption of technologies in the fitness space. Our company, Videri Ventures, which is invested in Vertimax, Montezumo, Gold's Gym, Houston, Texas, and Fitness 24-7 Thailand, also underwrites the podcast, along with our service companies, Integris Advisors, Moon Mission Media, and others. Please feel free to share this podcast with your colleagues. And if I can be of any assistance to you, don't hesitate to reach out brianklerourke at gmail.com or find me on any of the major social networks. Have a great day and thanks for listening.